Zoom meeting discussing the Jews from Alexandria and the return and rededication of the Eliyahu Hanavi Synagogue. And I'm happy to see uh, so many of interviewees here tonight. Thank you for joining us. Um, if you'd like to receive news for future events from SVUK and you're not on our mailing list, please let us have your email contact in the chat and we will add you to our list. So before introducing you to our speakers tonight, I'd like to say a little bit about the Sephardi Voices UK archive, which we found it in, 2000, we found it in 2011. Um, and although the first interviews were conducted a little bit earlier in 2009. Our aim was to tell the often forgotten stories of the Jews from the Middle East, North Africa and Iran who settled in Britain. We have now collected more than 103 interviews and we're grateful to the many interviewees who've shared their memories of growing up in places like Tangiers, Baghdad, Casablanca, Casablanca Alexandria, Cairo, Esfahan, Beirut, Benghazi, Wat Medani, or Tehran. They shared the memories of leaving their homes, often under difficult circumstances, and memories of going to new places, building up new communities, and forming new identities. Our interviewees are accessible at the British Library in London, uh, and soon also at Beta Tfutzot in Tel Aviv. But on request, the interviews are available through our website. Through our social media channels, we've created films and shared other wonderful materials from the archive. We hope that our work has enabled families and communities to connect with their past and celebrate the heritage, and for researchers and the general public to have a unique window into the lives of Jewish communities which no longer uh, exist. Due to the recent corona lockdown, we have started to conduct Zoom interviews, so please get in touch if you'd like to be interviewed. And I see Doris is here, whom I heard in South Hampstead the other day, and we'd love to interview. Please get in, in touch. Out of the 103 interviews we have conducted, 33 interviewees were born in Egypt, 17 in Alexandria. And this includes our recent interview with the Labour MP, Lady Margaret Hodge and her sister. It is not surprising that one third of our interviewees are Egyptian, because I find that many Egyptian Jews feel very strongly about telling the stories of their lives, which were so radically changed when they had to leave. And this is also expressed in the many books and memoirs produced by Egyptian Jews. Tonight, we're going to discuss the theme of return, and this is a, a often features at the end of all our interviews. Many years ago, I was privileged to go to a lecture by André Asiman in New York. He had just published his book, False Papers, Essays on Exiles and Memories. The first essay deals with his return to Alexandria and his realization that Alexandria will never leave him. I'd like to read this excerpt to you, if I may. Quote, I had hoped finally to let go of the city, knowing all the, all the while that the longing would start again soon enough and that one never washes away anything and that this mar marooned and spectral city, which is no longer home for me, would eventually find newer, ever more beguiling ways to remind me that here is where my mind always returns. That here I will always end up, even if I never come back. And I wonder if our panel tonight will agree with this notion of Alexandria as a state of mind. It is certainly a very poetic idea. We're lucky that we have three former Alexandrians present with us tonight who will discuss their own recent return to Alexandria. So let me introduce you to our guests, and maybe they can wave when I speak about them. So our first panelist is Alec Nakamuli. Alec, can you wave? Here's Alec. He was born in Alexandria, left in 1956 after the Suez Crisis, age 13. He works in IT for financial services, and he is the chair of Sephardi Voices UK, and a council member of the Nebi Daniel Association and the Association of Jews from Egypt. And he's also a volunteer guide on ancient Egypt at the British Museum. Ellie Chilton, Ellie, can you raise your hand? That's, here's Ellie Chilton. He was also born in Alexandria. He left in 1960, age 14. He set up and ran a manufacturing business in Scotland where he lived for more than 40 years. He's a trustee of the Sephardi Voices, of Sephardi Voices UK and also of the Jewish Literary Trust. While Alec and Ellie left Alexandria as teenagers, Josiane Gold. Josiane, please wave. 
here you are. Josiane Gold was expelled from Egypt with her parents in 1956, aged only six months old. She had a long career as a corporate finance lawyer in the city and now has various non-executive positions in the private equity industry. I will now hand you over to Daisy Aboudi, who is the Deputy Director of Safadi Voices UK, and she's going to chair tonight's proceeding. So, enjoy. Thank you, Bea, very much. And uh, I think we're going to get started. Um, Alec, can we start with you? Um, you were involved in organizing the trip, uh, but can I just ask you a little bit about the history, if you could give everyone a very brief history of, of Jews in Egypt so that we can uh, familiarize ourselves with that. Okay, I will start at the end of the 19th century when Egypt was actually a very prosperous country. The cotton boom following the US Civil War, the opening of the Suez Canal, and that attracted immigrants from all over Europe and the Middle East. French, British, Italians, Greeks, Armenians, Syrians, Iraqis, etc. It was a multicultural society, everybody trading and socializing irrespective of nationality and religion. And French was the lingua franca, although British, uh, Egypt was a British protectorate since 1882. So the Jewish community was a mix of indigenous Egyptian Jews and immigrants. And at the turn of the 20th century, it was considered as the richest in the Middle East. My father's family, for instance, came from Corfu in Greece, and my mother's from Aleppo. My grandfather had been president of the Cairo community, and the family business was, we were the major importers of paper. And I attended the Lycée Francais. Jews were very well integrated, active politically. You had Jews, uh, Katawi Pasha, Sir David Harari, who were head of, at the head of the Waft independence movement in the 1916s to 1920, up until Egypt got independent. And after independence in 1922, Katawi Pasha was the first minister of finance. Jews were also dominant in business. They were, uh, Katawi Pasha and Sir David Harari and Leon de Castro were on the boards of the Central Bank and the Misra Bank, the main bank. The main department stores, Hano, Sicurel, um, Oz de Bac, Ben Sion, were Jewish. One of my cousins was president of the cotton exchange and the cotton and stock exchanges closed on Jewish holidays. And also, of course, urban development. The tramways in Cairo were launched by the Suarez family. And in Alexandria, we had the whole draining of the marshes and the development of Smuha Garden City. Also in the arts, in cinema in particular, one of the moguls of uh, Egyptian cinema was Toga Mizrahi, and one of the most famous actresses was Leila Murad, who was the daughter of a Hazan. And incidentally, she was the one who, in 1952, the, when uh, the king was toppled, was chosen to sing the song of the revolution instead of the famous Um Kalsum. And also the king would attend the Kol Nidre service every year to mark his solidarity with the Jewish community. And just before World War II, the community numbered between 85 and 90,000. Antisemitism began to rise in the 1930s with the birth of the Muslim Brotherhood, but really things really came to a head after World War II. So the rising of Zionism and the establishment of the State of Israel against Arab nationalism. And there were regular riots every year on the anniversary of the Balfour Declaration and attacks on Jewish businesses. Then in 1948, we had the Israeli I want to me. Oh. Your microphone is Sorry. unmuted. And your video is stopped. Alors je tape là-dessus aussi. I'm just going to mute everyone. Okay, Alec. Okay. He's unmuting me. I mute myself. If you can. A thousand Jews left or were expelled. But the major exodus I was. Know, I need, I need to find a can I hear you? Yeah. No, we can hear you. Carry on. Yeah. 
But the major exodus was in 1956, after the Suez Crisis and War. 30 to 40,000 Jews were exiled, expelled, or forced to leave. Assets were confiscated. Most had to leave with 50 pounds, one suitcase, and intimate searches at departure. I left with my family on 15 December 1956, and I still remember we were already on board ship and my father was called to the cabin where the police was holding an office and was only released like three minutes before the boat sailed off. In 1967, there were about 2,000 Jews left. They had a hard time. They were interned in hard labor camps. In 1973, less than 1,000 left, also brutal internments and expulsions. And today, there are less than 10 Jews left in Egypt from a community which, as I said, numbered 85 to 90,000. So you came uh, to England as, as a teenager, as we said. Why did you, what inspired you to organize this trip? Can you just tell us a little bit about how it came about? Okay, about 15 years ago with uh, Roger Bilboul, Yves Fibdida, Philippe Ismaloun, and on the Cohen and a few others, we founded the Nebi Daniel Association, which is dedicated to the preservation of Jewish cultural and religious heritage in Egypt. And also we are actively seeking to obtain a copy of the Jewish community registers, which contain the certificates of birth, marriage and death. Five years ago, a large part of the roof of the Alexandria Synagogue collapsed. So we organized a campaign for its restoration and we also managed to get the synagogue listed by the World Monument Fund. The restoration was a three to four year project costing four million dollars, which was actually entirely financed by the Egyptian Ministry of Antiquities. We offered to raise funds externally, but they adamantly refused it. They maintained it was an Egyptian project. And you ought to realize that when we're talking about four million dollars, that's about one million dollars per Jew living in Alexandria today. The works were completed uh, last December and uh, Daisy, can you show the photos of first the exterior of the synagogue? Right, so you can see absolutely beautifully restored as most of us will remember. And if we now look at the interior, next photo. Wow, Josiane is going to talk in more detail about the restoration. So there was an official, let's say civil inauguration by the Egyptian government in January, but it had no religious content, kippot were not worn, and there were really no invitation to Jews from Egypt who had settled abroad. So with the Nebi Daniel Association, we decided to organize a return to Egypt to rededicate the synagogue and hold a Shabbat service on 14th to 15th February. So the program was quite sort of dense. People were arriving on Thursday and we had organized sort of uh, town visits by coach around Alexandria. On Friday morning, we had the visit to the cemeteries. Friday afternoon, the formal rededication of the synagogue and the Kabbalat Shabbat service. And then Saturday, Shabbat service. And on Sunday and Monday, we were guests of the Cairo community. Three rabbis were present from France, Italy, and very most touchingly, Rabbi Yosef Nefusi from Jerusalem, who is the son of the last officiating rabbi in Alexandria. So they recited Kaddish in the three cemeteries and they read out the names of those who were buried there. For, to give you an um, overview of the actual rededication Hanukkah Tabayit uh, ceremony, I'm gonna ask Daisy, this is an excerpt from a program on Italian television, which was based on an interview with uh, Nesim Hazan from Alexandria and who is now president of the Italian Sephardim. Prima di tutto, il rito della Mesusa 
l'astuccio che contiene una preghiera e che si mette sullo stipite delle porte quando si inaugura un edificio. Poi l'ingresso in sinagoga con i rotoli della legge. Il momento eccitante della cerimonia, i due momenti sono stati. Quando abbiamo preso il Sefarim e abbiamo cantato e siamo entrati nella sinagoga con tutti i Sefarim, è un momento in cui ho visto piangere persone della mia età e il secondo momento ancora più forte è stato quando ho sentito il suono dello shofar. È stato proprio un, un avvolgimento di pensieri, di, di situazioni. Ok, well I hope this gives you an over uh, sort of view of a the synagogue and also the dedication ceremony. After that there were some speeches which we will spare you and then we lit up some memorial candles. In fact people had sent lists of names and we actually lit 300 candles and all the names were recited by the younger members of the trip. And then we had the Friday evening Kabbalah Shabbat service with uh, Kiddusha afterwards. And what was the challenges? Obviously, this is Egypt. It's still not 100% easy for Jewish people to go and you are 180 people. So can you just talk us through some of the challenges of actually organizing the trip itself? Well, first of all, we had very little time. We all know about building projects which overrun. So we actually had to wait till the restoration work was complete and the site was cleared and that was end of December so it was actually six weeks between the end of December and mid-February. The cemeteries were in a terrible condition, they were totally overgrown but we raised about $35,000 in less than three weeks to clean them up from the Egyptian Jewish diaspora including many who actually did not travel but contributed and asked for the names of their relatives who were buried there to be mentioned. Also, you probably know that in most of the Sephardi synagogues, the seats bear the names of their owners. So we asked travelers ahead to give us the names of their parents or grandparents who had seats there, and the community actually laid them out so that visitors could sit in those. But as you can imagine, and you hinted, Daisy, the major issue was security. So right at the beginning, we asked the community to get clearance. And we were originally told, ma fiche problem, no problem, you can bring 200 people. End of January, when we already had over 100 people registered who had actually bought tickets and made hotel and booked hotel rooms, we were told not more than 60. So lots of discussions and negotiations, but at the end, it was a call to the US Embassy who intervened and solved the problem. So on top of that, the security issue was compounded by the presence on Friday of the US ambassador, actually Jewish, Jonathan Cohen, the UK and French consuls, and a former Israeli ambassador to Egypt. Also, we had about 40 visitors from Israel, and they are given special security treatment through a dedicated travel agency who works with the Egyptian and I'm sure the Israeli security. So security was very strict. We were constantly escorted as a group. We had to take coaches even for the shorter trips. So you had a motorcade, you had a police car with red flashing uh, lights. You had the first coach, then you had another police car, then you had the second coach, and then you had a closing police car with again red flashing and blue lights. There were armed police and security outside the hotels, the restaurant, the synagogue, and the street, the Nebi Daniel street, where the synagogue is located, was totally sealed off on Friday and Saturday. And then, of course, you've got 180 Jews from Egypt, including 40 from Israel. I mean, who could ask for a more disciplined, uncomplaining, easy to satisfy bunch? But as the saying goes, it all went all right on the night and we remain grateful to the Egyptian government for the restoration and their collaboration during the trip. And for you personally, what was, it's quite a, an organizational feat, but it's also a personal trip. And 
what were the, the highlights for you? What, what did you find most rewarding? Well, first of all, we were absolutely overawed by the number of people who attended, 180. We never anticipated those numbers. Our wildest optimistic sort of estimates beforehand, we'd get 100, 120 people. Um, and as I said, it all went well, no incidents, no illnesses. But looking back, I can't sort of believe the timing. If this had been scheduled two weeks later, we would have come into the whole coronavirus nightmare and the, this whole event would probably never have happened. I personally was probably too involved in the organization and I was also the MC for the Friday afternoon. So to a certain extent, my emotions were repressed by organization worries. As an example, one of the panics is as the Sepharim were carried in, as you saw under the Talet, we couldn't find the key of the Ark to open it up. But, you know, at the end, looking back, so to me, probably the Kaddish in the cemetery where my grandparents are buried was one of the high points and hearing the names. But really, it was uh, sitting in my father's seat, reading from his prayer book, wearing my uncle's talet, and I also had with me this talet bag, which my mother had sewed for my paternal grandfather. So her future father-in-law, when my parents got engaged over 80 years ago. And I think this is probably what's going to remain with me. Thank you. That was really lovely and amazing to see the, the talit bag. It's gorgeous. Um, Ellie, you were nodding through quite a lot of that. Um, can you uh, tell us when did you first hear about the trip? Well, I, uh, I was invited late in November last year to a small dinner uh, to welcome uh, Levana Zamir, who is the president of the Jews of, all, of Arab countries. And uh, at the dinner, there was a bit of a discussion naturally about the Nebi Daniel synagogue. And um, there was discussion about the refurbishment, but particularly uh, a little bit of uh, unhappiness at the fact that the Egyptian government, three weeks from this dinner, had decided to have an opening. And as Alec mentioned, they had not invited anyone from the Nebi Daniel Association or any Jews from Egypt. And uh, I think Roger Bilbul was there and he said, anybody wants to go. But the consensus around the table was that it was impossible to drop everything and go there. And then I don't know who mentioned it, that why don't we have our own, uh, our own uh, dedication? And that's how it came about. Uh, immediately I heard that, I put my hand up and I said, I'm coming and I'll bring part of my family with me. So, uh, so we did, we ended up, can I see the, the first photo please? Um, we ended up with, uh, with uh, nine of us. And you can see us now, not this one. And you can see us now there. Uh, you can see Daniela, my daughter, my wife, Louise. These are our three granddaughters, Daniela's children, uh, Jonathan, Susie, my sister, is obviously from Alexandria, and, um, and Karina, who is my late brother's daughter. So that was our little group. And it was absolutely wonderful to have them uh, with me on this trip. Um, so I think that uh, I have to say at the outset that how grateful um, as a participant to the group I am to the Nebi Daniel Association for putting up this fantastic trip. And you just can't imagine, I think that Alec has underestimated the amount of work that, uh, that has been done to organize this trip. It's unbelievable. Um, it was obviously very important for you to take your whole family. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about that? And... Yes. Uh, 
first of all, uh, it was part first of all, I, I really should say that uh, I have taken my children to Egypt before. In 1999, uh, we went for a holiday uh, in Egypt. We visited the, the whole of Egypt, but of course, we spent two days in Alexandria. And that was 40 years exactly after I left. Um, when, when I was in Alexandria, we obviously visited the, the synagogue and you can see us there, uh, Louise and I with our three children. And uh, you can see the difference uh, of the synagogue. It looks a little bit tarred. You can see here the, the yellowing of the marble, etc. And of course, the photograph that Alec was able to show is the pristine refurbishment of the synagogue, which looked absolutely fantastic. So we went to Alexandria. I was able to take the children to my old school. We visited my father's jewelry shop, which is now uh, selling God knows what. Uh, and uh, and uh, we obviously went to the cemetery. And that was the first time that I went back to see my father who is buried there. Um, uh, in 40 years. Um, I also was able to take the children to all the familiar places, to the lease where we, as children, we were taken for tea and have the wonderful cakes, oriental cakes, uh, and, uh, and, um, and also uh, taking them to Binyamin to taste the best full and falafel. So we had a great time, but, uh, but also at the synagogue, one thing was extremely emotional was that we met two people in their 90s, uh, Monsieur Harari and Madame Matatia, who between them run the community, which at the time probably was probably 30 or 40 strong. And when we went to the office to meet them and introduced ourselves, uh, we were taken back completely because Monsieur Harari said that he remembered my father. At this point, my wife, Louise, couldn't hold herself. She burst into tears. It was very, very emotional. Um, we then went into the synagogue and, and started hunting around to find my father's seat, which we eventually found. And, uh, and with this trip, it was the very first time that I was able to share with my children, with my immediate family, uh, my history, my past. And uh, it was really very special, the family culture. And, um, and that was very special. But you asked me about the importance of the trip to Alexandria last year. Well, it was especially important because you see Nebi Daniel is our is our family synagogue. That's where we were brought up. That's where my father went to pray. That's where I put the tefillin, which for the non Sephardis is uh, the bar mitzvahs. Uh, I had there and my brother did as well. Um, so it was very, very important. On top of that, uh, as I mentioned, my father uh, died in Alexandria in 1957 when I was very young. So. We left Egypt leaving behind my father and his parents and a few uncles in the cemetery. And uh, returning there, that's my father and my mother. Uh, in fact, they were married at the synagogue, at the Nebi Daniel synagogue. And that's their engagement picture, which was taken in April 1938. Um, so, in a way, going back there, it was a way of telling our loved one that we left behind that we haven't abandoned them, that we have come back and they were not alone. And we are thinking about them. This was very, very emotional, as you can imagine. Uh, when we left Egypt, my mother was very distressed because we were leaving never to return and to an uncertain future. And you can imagine at the age my mother was, it wasn't 
very easy. So throughout the trip, I was thinking about both of them, uh, my mother and my father. Um, returning was very important, returning to Nebi Daniel, because it's our heritage. You see, and like most people, um, they live in a country, they live in a city, and they're there all their lives. But we, at the age of 14, we leave. And then we've lost our past. We can't go back. We can't go back to show our children, our grandchildren, where we were, etc. And uh, so in, in this sense, it was a particularly important because you leave at 14 and it's all fading memories, memories that go away. And uh, so by returning, taking the children, it was a way of showing particularly our grandchildren, which you saw in the picture, to show their identity, where they come from, who they are. And, uh, and that was particularly important. You mentioned your memories that were going back and, and reconnecting with those memories. And did going back affect your memory in any way? Did it change or did it bring back any memories? I think, I think going back, brought back some memories. Uh, I, when I left Egypt, I just turned the page and uh, looked at the future and started a new life in Europe, just left, get on with life and uh, fight to, to move on. Uh, and when you are in this mind, you don't think very much. I didn't think at all about Egypt. I just moved on. And, um, and really, it's in the very latter year, in fact, when I moved to London in uh, 2013, meeting Alec and getting involved with Sephardi Voices, that I became more and more interested in, uh, in our past there. So um, memories that were all buried started coming back. And there were many of them. Um, so, uh, in particular, moving into the synagogue when we moved in, uh, the, you know, I remember clearly uh, my bar mitzvah standing at the bima and reading the, the Sefer Torah. Uh, and I remember there's a photograph of a, of a fountain. There was a, I, rem I was so happy to see this little fountain, which has the big significance. This fountain is found in the, in the entrance of the synagogue where you saw the photograph on nearby there. And I remember clearly in Yom Kippur, where in, obviously in, in Egypt is quite hot. And the big problem with fasting is, is that you are thirsty and you want water. And I remember as children, we were all queuing around the end of the service, waiting for the shofar to sound, and then all started drinking water from this fountain. In fact, when I went the first time back, I said to the children, I must find this fountain. And of course, we found it because it was there. So it, uh, that's a memory that was brought back. Um, of course, I took uh, my grandchildren and uh, we went to my old school. And, um, and uh, so it was, it was very good. It reminded me the number we, uh, uh, yes, that you can see my three granddaughters. This was by pure luck, the very class where I used to remember being at Collège Saint-Marc. Um, there was a teacher there. So I knocked on the door uh, with all my followings behind me. And, uh, and I explained and she welcomed, she welcomed us in and I was able to sit at the, at the desk, le pupitre as we used to call it in French, uh, at the desk there with, uh, with my youngest granddaughter and you can see the other two there. But um, so it was, it was fabulous to be able to show them that what I, I would have never thought it would ever, ever be possible. Um, and, uh, <laughs> And then it brought other memories, the times that uh, my brother and I escaped from the boarding school that, uh, that we were at. And, 
and we, we were all brought back the next day, always. We skipped one day, we were brought back the next. Uh, so lots of childhood, lots of childhood memories came back to you. Yeah, in fact, the first trip to Egypt, I said to my children and Louise, let's trace back my escape route. <laughs> and we walked from the school to, uh, to my house uh, as, a, as a memory walk. So, yeah, that was uh, another... Um, um, and the same question I'm going to ask, I asked Alec, I'm going to ask you and I'm going to ask Josiane, what was your personal highlight of the trip? Yeah, this trip, uh, undoubtedly, the, the most important part for me was the rededication of the, uh, the rededication ceremony. Uh, it was just so emotional. And, uh, and it was very, very difficult to hold back the tears, frankly, throughout the, the ceremony. And uh, it started after putting the mezuzah up, the procession, which you can see here, and you saw the film as well, which would describe even more the, the, the situation. You, you can see the, this procession of the Sefer Torah coming in. It was like saying, we're back, we're, ta we're, we're making this building again our synagogue. And that feeling was incredible. And uh, they moved in, singing, chanting, it was absolutely full of it. That, that was a, a, a particularly good, um, uh, important moment. Uh, and, uh, you know, 60 years ago, exactly, at the, the time I left on this trip, to this trip, and to be back there, not only as a tourist, that's different. We were back, 180 of us. We were back as a community, and we were back there, to pray together as we did 60 years ago. That, I can't describe the feeling. Very, very strong and very emotional. Um, of course, you can see there my two granddaughter sitting with, uh, in my father's seat. And you just imagine that's, that's the fourth generation. And that's my father's seat, which they all had the plate there. But the fourth generation sitting there and how can you just imagine on this dark July day in 1960 when we left thinking we'll never come back, that we would have such a joy having two granddaughters, my three granddaughters with me and sitting on my father's seat. Of course, like Alec, uh, another very important moment was to, um, uh, when I sat throughout the service uh, on my father's seat, I can't describe the feeling. You just, it's unbelievable, unbelievable. But I just want to take, take away the focus from, from me immediately and tell you a little story. Uh, in the, uh, at the Friday night service, there were two men in their 80s and they were singing. And, uh, and I was near them and, and one of them turned around and showed me this old, book. He said, I was in the choir with him, with the other man pointing at him, they were side by side. He said, that's the book we were singing from. And then they carried on singing. Uh, and, and they were, you know, you, you, you can't imagine the enthusiasm. And, uh, and they were singing the tunes, the, the Nebi Daniel tunes, but the two of them had, uh, had um, tears coming down their faces. And that's, you know, the, the whole emotional. Uh, I can talk to you the whole evening on all that. But <laughs> perhaps I, so I just want to say one more thing that uh, when I left Egypt, I turned the page, forgot everything, didn't want to know. Uh, I think it's in retrospect is I never grieved leaving Egypt. And this trip permitted me to, uh, to, um, to um, how can you say, lost the word. Uh, to, um, uh, to process. Put that Sorry. To process. Yeah, the end of the process, basically, and uh, and I felt that uh, uh, it provided a closure. That's what I want to say. It provided a closure to my forgotten past. 
Thank you. That's a uh, um, Josiane. I'm going to come to you. Um, you left as a child. Can you just give us a little bit of background on on your family? Well, on my connection to Egypt. Um, yes, thank you, Daisy. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, it's uh, it's wonderful to be here uh, amongst so many people who probably know a lot more about uh, about life in Egypt than I do. But uh, I qualify by the skin of my teeth uh, to speak today because, uh, like uh, Ellie, I was uh, born in uh, Alexandria. Uh, just a few days after the end of the, the Suez War, uh, November 56, and my father was expelled to London um, uh, with his British passport. My mother was allowed to stay in Egypt um, because she had a Greek passport. Uh, so she stayed with her newborn child and uh, joined him a few months later uh, when I was six months old. So. At six months, I have no reminiscences. Ellie, it was wonderful to hear you speaking about your memories of, uh, of Alexandria. Uh, I'm a little envious of that. Um, uh, I obviously um, uh, had to rebuild some of that um, uh, by um, over time uh, through uh, what I learned from my parents and also what I learned through these visits. Um, so in those, those years, when I was growing up, my connection to my place of birth was really just through the routines of family life. Um, you know, we lived in London, but um, we spoke French, uh, although uh, as children we answered our parents back in, in English always. Uh, we enjoyed the wonderful Middle Eastern food, rich lovely food, my mother was a superb cook, uh, and of course my parents' close friends was, um, was a group of, um, of, of um, people from Egypt, from Alexandria and from Cairo. Uh, those were the closest friends, uh, and of course there were the regular card games. Uh, that, that was what I grew up with, and um, uh, I was very proud of my Jewish-Egyptian um, heritage, uh, and made me feel a little exotic. Uh, a little bit different. Um, but the actual details of life in, in Alexandria and um, of uh, the traumatic expulsion um, were really spoken about. My parents didn't talk about it. Um, maybe it was still, uh, there was still a certain sort of bitterness about uh, what had happened to them, the fact they'd lost their home and, uh, and a life that they, that they loved. Um, and they never returned to Egypt. Um, so there were a lot of gaps in my, my knowledge of where I was born and the life that I might have led. Uh, and um, some 22 years ago, my brother Eve um, took me to um, Egypt. He took me to Cairo and to Alexandria. Uh, he was 12 when he left and so he had memories uh, and he was able to fill some of those gaps for me. Uh, and that was actually the first time that I saw uh, the, the, the synagogue of Alexandria, um, Eliyahu Hanabi. Uh, here you go, here's my parents who um, were married in the synagogue and they're standing on the steps of the synagogue uh, and behind them there, there's my aunt and uncle. Uh, and that's a photograph that was really important to me. I grew up with that picture and I had that vision uh, of them there in this, uh, in this synagogue. And, uh, and so to go there with, uh, with my brother and, uh, and see it uh, was quite overwhelming. Um, my parents were married there. My, my father, you know, father's family, two generations prayed there. We saw the brass nameplate uh, as um, uh, Alec and, uh, and Ellie have mentioned. Uh, so that was, uh, that was a, a very special experience. So that was, that, that was the extent of my connection to Egypt until, until we come to, to February. Um, and, uh, and, and, and joining the trip for the rededication. And you, um, or your, was it your brother who had studied the synagogue quite a lot? Can you tell us a little bit about the history of the synagogue? Well, can I perhaps, um, before I get to the history, um, yeah. because I, I mean, I, I'd like to talk about the sort of the highlights, that uh, my highlights. Of course, go for it. <laughs> and in the, in the highlights, um, uh, I think for any historian, it was just extraordinary. And I will talk about, uh, about the synagogue. But I, I, I mean, just in terms of my motivations for joining the trip, yeah. um, uh, there were, I, I mean, 
there had been, Eve had been, uh, my brother had been a, a founder member of the Nebi Daniel Association that Alec mentioned. Uh, and so he was passionate about protecting the, uh, the Jewish heritage in Egypt. Uh, and so this is what I was exposed to for many years. And, uh, uh, and um, uh, it, you know, there was no way I was going to miss out on this, uh, on this trip. Uh, so I, I, absolutely, I was there. Uh, and the wonderful thing for me was that my daughter, uh, was quite excited to come with me um, and to learn about uh, our, our heritage and uh, and so that there was that element of continuity which um, which was really very important to me um, and also the opportunity to travel um, to Egypt with a large family group for whom you know each of, you know, for each of whom this was an important trip uh, so I was with my sister my brother uh, all of my brother's family my cousin family friends and also um, had this lovely opportunity to reconnect uh, with friends family friends from overseas uh, who I hadn't seen for a long long time um, there was one other slightly sort of tenuous link for me and that was that um, uh, a few years before, my son was married in the, um, the great synagogue of Florence. Um, and um, because of, well, just the, the day before the wedding, um, there, was, uh, there was mention because of the groom's um, uh, background um, to a connection to uh, Alexandria through his mother. Uh, there was mention of some links between the synagogue of Florence and the synagogue of, um, of Alexandria. Um, actually, um, uh, there's a certain irony because the synagogue of great synagogue of Florence uh, is um, an oriental building, it's built in, in, built in Moorish style and it's a magnificent building, um, but would have looked very appropriate in Alexandria and yet you have this glorious synagogue of Alexandria, El Eliyahu Hanavi, which is built in classical Italian style. Uh, and so there was, uh, you know, there was that, um, that difference between them, uh, which was interesting. Uh, but also there were um, a number of the um, uh, the, the the rabbis, the, the chief rabbis of Alexandria, who actually came from Florence, and so there were a number of links, which again I think um, sort of um, uh, made me feel more strongly uh, that I wanted to go back and uh, and see uh, the the Alexandrian synagogue again. Uh, so, I mean, with all of these, the emotions uh, for this visit were high before we even got started. Um, so, sorry, you asked me to talk about um, about the history. Uh, is is that right? Do you want me to um, come on that? Yeah. Well, it, while we're while we're talking about the motivations and and you mm. know and and some of the you've kind of touched on it, but maybe you could just tell us the impact of actually being there after all this build up and all these expectations, um, and oh. and the um, the impact that had on your emotions and and the way your perception of Egypt changed having actually seen it in that way? Well, it, I don't know that um, anything changed. I mean, you've got to, of course, come back to the fact that this was um, a, uh, th this was the first full um, service with that larger congregation for 60 years. Um, now, I mean, I, you know, we've heard from Ellie and from Alec how emotional that was. I found it incredibly emotion, emotional, uh, even though I had, didn't have those same memories. Um, uh, but, um, you know, it, it, it left a lot of questions as to what happens next, but perhaps we can come on to that. Um, just in terms of being there, I mean, you come into this synagogue, it is magnificent. You've seen the photographs. Uh, that, that uh, neoclassical structure, the rose-coloured columns, um, the green and pink stained glass windows um, uh, with the motif of the lotus flower, uh, the national flower of Egypt. Um, it's a very bright building, uh, full of light. Um, and we've seen that, uh, that, uh, that lovely photograph. Um, and you can see the yellow and the blue. Uh, it's, it, it's very spiritual, um, but in a, a, a not in a sort of typical sombre way of many of many synagogues. It's uh, uh, so it it really is um, sort of overwhelmingly beautiful. Um, and then, um, Daisy, I wonder if you can show those photographs of the restoration because uh, the restoration itself uh, was 
very cleverly done and very sensitively done. Uh, you'll see that, no, that it's an, that's it. Uh, you'll see that um, in the restoration, um, uh, the, the uh, Egyptians actually uh, revealed the history of the synagogue. Um, and you'll see here that they opened the floor uh, and you can see beneath um, some of the remains of the 11th century synagogue that, um, that, was, that preceded uh, the synagogue that we now have. Um, and um, the 11th century synagogue was destroyed um, by earthquakes and by um, crossfire between British and French troops uh, in the land battle for Alexandria right at the very end of the 18th century, beginning of the 19th century. Uh, and then the, the current synagogue was rebuilt in 1850. Um, uh, and actually the synagogue or a synagogue of Alexandria is even mentioned in the Talmud. Uh, which talks of a vast synagogue in Alexandria, so vast uh, that someone had to stand on a stool uh, to tell the congregants when to say Amen. Uh, so there's a tremendous history uh, to the synagogue of, uh, of Alexandria and, uh, and I particularly liked uh, what they had done, what the, um, uh, the, the, those who renovated had done here in, in, in revealing that history. Um, so whilst, whilst in the synagogue and talking about the sort of events that we've heard about, um, for me, there was a very, very special moment when uh, my niece um, lit the candles uh, for Friday night and sang the prayer in her sweetest voice. Uh, and that is a, that's a very precious moment um, and a moment that sort of conjures up for you or for me um, my entire family, um, past and present, I could see, in a flash, I could see everybody uh, as the candles were being lit for Friday night. Um, and I also have um, a slightly irreverent um, vision um, of um, during the, on the Friday, before Shabbat, I hate, hasten to add, very important to say, before Shabbat, uh, the three officiating rabbis were all sitting together um, on a, a bench. Um, and um, this was during the speeches. Uh, and each one of them had his telephone out, his mobile app, and was scrolling on the phone. Uh, and it was a particularly lovely sight uh, when one saw that the rabbis were human too, and, uh, and just as, um, as vulnerable as the rest of us to be distracted by their, by their phones. Uh, so that, that was rather a, a, rather a nice moment. Um, uh, then I, others have mentioned, Ellie mentioned Delice, um, uh, and we've got a photograph, I think, uh, of Delice. Uh, so after, after Shabbat, we went to, uh, to have uh, some tea and we enjoyed these glorious uh, baklava. Uh, and uh, and that, uh, that, that also was a special moment. And Delice had certainly been mentioned to me by my parents, so it was lovely to go there. Uh, so, um, so I think is uh, what I'm going to do now is ask uh, Alec, Ellie and uh, Josiane, all of you together, um, something that Josiane kind of touched on is, is the question of what next and what, what we've established that the, you know, the synagogue is now being opened. What, what's the next step, do you think? How long is a piece of string? <laughs> Basically, I don't think we're going to have, it's going to, will it continue as a functioning synagogue? In short term, no, because there is no Jewish community. There is no minyan, we can't hold services, etc. And I think this addresses the whole future of the Egyptian religious heritage, the Jewish religious heritage in Egypt because there are, to put it in perspective, there were 18 synagogues in Cairo and 12 in Alexandria. The two communities who acted independently took different paths. The Alexandria synagogue as the co a community, as the community uh, dwindled, realized there was no point of keeping maintaining 12 synagogues. So they sold most of the more recent ones for real estate development and all that. And with the remaining funds, they maintained the uh, Eliyahu Hanavi, not always very well. 
and also they paid for the medical uh, old people's homes, etc., for the surviving old Jewish ladies who were still there. Uh, in Cairo, on the other hand, they decided not to sell any synagogues. So there are four which are in reasonable condition and all the rest are collapsing in ruins. Are we going to see a return of Jewish life in Egypt as we've seen in Eastern Europe? I very much doubt it. So perhaps are these synagogues, some of the part of them could be reopened as museums or at least have a part of them dedicated to a museum which retraces the history of the Jews in Egypt, which let's be totally honest, up till about 10 years ago, uh, the Egyptian government was ready, was more or less airbrushing. Any of you got, yeah, Josiane. I mean, I think it's also notable that the way that, uh, as I alluded to before, that the way that the Egyptians went about the renovation, which they did beautifully, um, but was to actually open up the floor. Now, if you are anticipating um, a continuing use for the synagogue, you don't open up the floor. So they clearly had a mind there to um, the tourist industry, um, uh, rather than um, any continu continuation of the Jewish community. So um, I think that sort of said it all in terms of, um, uh, you know, the, the, the sort of future. Uh, for the um, uh, for, for, for the synagogue. I think as Alex said at the beginning it was funded by the Ministry of Antiquities not any sort of um, <laughs> you know Ministry of Religion or anything like that. Um, uh, I've got I'm gonna go to questions now if, unless um, any of you have anything that you'd like to add. Yeah, well. No? Okay, so I've got the very first question I've got is a very quick one. Um, Ellie, what was the name of your school? College San Mark. <laughs> College San Mark, can you hear that? Yeah, why? Yeah. <laughs> Lovely. Um, if you've got any questions, if you um, either raise your hand like this or digitally raise your hand, um, then I'll scroll through the pages and, and see where I can find you. Or if you'd like to type one, I can do that as well. I'm just going to scroll through because I've got quite a few screens here. Oh, here we go. Eve Sharma. Thank you all three for such a delightful uh, summary. Alec, I wanted to ask if there's a possibility of uh, another trip being organized in the next uh, two, three or four years while we're hopefully still around to pick up on the ones that didn't attend the first time? Well, I think there's first of all the question of when are we going to get out of this uh, virus nightmare and we'll be able to travel freely. That is, so you know, so I don't see it obviously for, you know, Coronavirus, we know nothing about what's or how it's developing or not developing in Egypt. But so not before, I'd say at least two years. Afterwards, yes, why not? Um, although I doubt that it will have the emotion of this rededication and the first major return. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I know we have uh, Rabbi Nafusi here. Would you be willing to um, just say a few words maybe from your perspective? Hi, good evening, everyone. I would like to thank the organizers, first of all, uh, of course, Alec and uh, Eve's and uh, Roger Bilboul, as we used to call him back in the old country, uh, I was very, very, very um, touched when I came to Alexandria. I was probably one of the last ones to leave. We left in November 1967 after the Six Day War. And uh, we were the last Jews there. My father was in jail for 10 days and uh, he suffered there for those 10 days. But Baruch Hashem, he got out on Shavuot itself. 
And uh, when we left in November 1967. Yeah, please continue. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Please oh. continue. <laughs> when we left, when we left in November 1967, we went to Italy for three months. We were in Ostia. We got our papers uh, together and we came to New York. And um, Baruch Hashem in New York, there was a community there, the Syrian community, and there's an Egyptian community, but very few Jews from Alexandria. Most of the Jews were from Cairo. And we had a shul there and uh, we prayed with the Egyptian shul, um, and Baruch Hashem. It was really, really something very special. So when I came to Alexandria this time, I was very touched. I was very emotional. Elik was sitting next to him and he saw when the Hazan from, from France was singing. I, I was so touched. I, w I started to cry because it reminded me of my father and uh, my grandfather. My great-grandfather were all in this room in Alexandria. As a matter of fact, my great-grandfather, or the Chai Nefusi, was married in that shul in 1888. And of course, my grandfather, Shmuel Nafusi, and my father, 1949, got married in that shul. And I basically grew up in that shul. My father was there all day. My father was the rabbi from 56 to 67. And we grew up in that shul. We were there in that shul all the time. And uh, that's why I was touched so much. And I, I, uh, I really didn't know if I was gonna come to Alexandria. Unfortunately, one of our daughters didn't feel well. She had um, uh, severe meningitis and I was in touch with um, Eves and I told him that I want very much to come and Baruch Hashem, she got better and uh, it's behind us, behind us and, and I came and it was very, very, very um, touchy. It was very touchy, but Baruch Hashem, we did it and like, like Alex said, we don't know this coronavirus, what's going to be. But two, three years, four years down the line, if we can get together again and go to Alexandria, it would be a great thing. And one more thing I just want to say, we have to have gratitude to Alexandria, to Egypt in general. Many, 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 many Jews were there over the decades, over the, 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 the rabbis, hachamim, that wrote sefarim and um, printed them in in. Cairo, in Alexandria. We have so much gratitude to Egypt in general for all those generations and decades and, 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 and centuries that the Jews were there. So really, we owe a lot to Egypt in general. And we want to thank the Egyptians for having us for so many years as, as Jews in, in, in Egypt. And uh, that's it. That's, that's all I have to say. Thank you, thank you so much for that and for, for adding your, your input on, on that as well. Um, I've got a few questions for people um, now. Um, I think this is probably mostly to Alec. Um, can you talk a little bit, a bit more about the uh, records, the records for the Jewish community that are still in Egypt and what's happening with them and what the situation with them is? Okay, so these are the civil registers of the communities which record the births, marriages, and deaths within the community. And for most of us, they are not only our only proof of religious identity, but also civilian identity. You know, I had a, when I was born, uh, I had a group, I was Greek citizen, but my birth certificate was not issued by the Greek consulate nor by the Alexandria municipality, but by the Alexandria community, the rabbinate of Alexandria. So what happened about three, four years ago is that those, uh, we have been asked, looking for about 10, 12 years now to be able to take a copy of them, a digital copy, not take the originals out, but just take a digital copy. And the communities were really reluctant to do that they were afraid of the secret service and the police. And then about three years ago, the registers were actually seized by the Egyptian authorities. They came to the synagogues in Cairo and Alexandria, they took them and they have deposited them at the National Archive. And since then we have 
not had any access to them. And we are continuing our action. We have written to President Sisi about it, but as I, uh, you know, for 12 years, let's be totally honest, we've been treading sand. I don't know if Roger or Yves, who are on the call, would like to add something. Well, just to say that the access to the registers have been a tremendous struggle. And we've been fighting this from the very beginning of uh, the establishment of our association, which is about 15 years. And the registers were kept until relatively recently in the offices of the community. They were very well organized in Alexandria. There was something like uh, 60,000 pages of information dating back to the uh, 1820, 1840. Uh, a wealth of information that is really unimaginable. Uh, so much detail, so much uh, uh, data related to the life of the people who lived there. And uh, there was some reluctance that we have never really quite understood on the part of the Egyptian authorities not to make this information widely available outside of the community offices. And the more pressure that we put to have access to this information, the more reluctant they were in forbidding us from having such uh, access. So much so, that uh, today they have been, well, uh, given uh, to the National Archives and we've been promised that they're being organized so that we can have easy access. But every request we made has never been answered and we've been continuing to fight to have access to this wealth of information, which is really our identity. And uh, we we're still fighting and we're hoping that one day we'll get there. Do you know if uh, researchers from institutions can access them? Nobody can access them. Nobody can access them. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And yes. that's where we are. Anybody who has any bright ideas as to how we can convince the Egyptian authorities to give us a copy of those registers, they're welcome to join our group and fight with us. Uh, Alec, did you have something to add to that? Thank you, Roger. Yes, uh, Roger said that we never really got a clear answer about why we were not allowed to take copies. However, we had one just before the Arab Spring. So I think it was November, December uh, 2010. We had a meeting with uh, Mohammed Abul Gate, who at the time was the Egyptian foreign minister and who is now actually the president or the secretary of the Arab League. And he actually said that the reason why they were reluctant to let us have a copy is that they did not want them to be used as a basis for compensations and claims. But that is a false argument because what you need for a, as a basis for a claim or compensation is a document of title to a property, to, to a business or to a piece of land or whatever. And those are, there are absolutely nothing of that type in those registers. It is purely birth, marriages and death. Um, Eve, did you want to add anything to I, that? I, I, think, I think it's fair to say that um, with regards to Jews and Judaism or uh, Jewish past, um, Egypt has done everything that they can and probably better than most other Arab countries to preserve its history as it relates to Egypt. However, unlike many other Arab countries, they have done nothing um, to satisfy or to recognize uh, um, the, 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 the histor at least the, the historical action that, they, that the Egyptian government has taken towards its Jews in the past. And they have done nothing to try and satisfy or to try and, 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 and uh, if you like, come, come to some kind of understanding with the Jews who have left Egypt. If, if you look at what they have done, they have preserved synagogues, they have preserved buildings. These buildings will work out for tourism, they will work out in the interest of Egypt. With regards to the interest of Jews, 
previously in Egypt, there has been absolutely no effort. And in fact, I think that there is total disdain from the point of view of the Egyptian government towards Jews from Egypt. I think it is um, high time. We've been on this. I think Roger wants to make himself younger, but we've been on this for 17 years. We've been knocking at their door. We've been at every governmental level. We've been at every uh, ambassadorial channel, um, whether American, whether Egyptian, whether French, whether British. And we have had a closed door on this particular subject. And when you think about it, we were kicked out of Egypt because we were Jews, and yet we are being denied the very proof that we are Jews. And I, I think that is really a, a quite, quite an, uh, an, in, a, an additional insult to what our parents have suffered. Uh, if I may just make a point as to, to um, how I feel about um, this whole ceremony that uh, 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 took place in February. As far as I'm concerned, it was closure. We, we left Egypt indignantly. They, they kicked our parents out in a very uh, uh, distasteful way, which was not necessary. Um, they didn't have to go through all these problems, whether it is Rabbi Nefusi's, uh, 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 who, who was jailed, like 700 other Jews, and some of them stayed in, in jail for five or six years, whether it was our parents who had uh, uh, a week or ten, or, or 10 days to leave Egypt, with leaving everything behind. There, is, there was no need to go through that, this kind of, uh, of um, action. And if you, if you put yourself in the position of somebody who is a Muslim, let's just say, in, in France or in England, um, and if you explain to him that this is what's going to happen to him in two generations or to his children, and he's going to be kicked out in wh whatever, and, and whether he has an, a, a British passport or a French passport or not doesn't matter, I think you would find that most people wouldn't understand this. So I think, for me, this was closure because the indignity of their departure was um, somehow compensated by the dignity that we found again, the majesty we found again in this building, and the fact that we asserted ourselves in this building. We asserted the fact that this was a Jewish building. It was a prayer. The, 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 the ceremony that took place in January, in which there were about 200 press video and I don't know how many people uh, from the government, none of them, none of them took into account that this was a synagogue. This was an Egyptian building. And I think it was a very important for us to rem remind them that this may be an Egyptian building for the next few years or the next centuries, but before that, it was a, a Jewish building. And uh, uh, as far as I'm concerned, this was very important. Um, we had uh, a lot of emotional moments uh, and we, we, we put a lot of symbolism into that dedication ceremony. And uh, for me, I think the most important moment was um, when on Saturday we took out 12 sc Torah scrolls. And, and you know, the figure 12 is basically for the, for the, the, the 12 tribes of Israel. And in this particular case, and in this particular time, where basically we also read the Ten Commandments, for me, it was a reminder that these 12 tribes are now dispersed. The tribes from Egypt are dispersed throughout the world. And yet there was a unifying moment there when we were all together represented by the Sifre Torah. Um, I think the question of the registers has to come to a conclusion as well. It is not acceptable that we cannot access and we cannot have a copy of our rabbinical records. They were made by rabbis, for rabbis, and they contain our whole history, the whole history of this um, uh, community. So I better shut up now because I can go on like this for a couple of hours. Anyway. I've got a few questions that um, are waiting and then I'm going to um, open up the uh, conversation because I know we've got a lot of people who are on the trip and who would probably like to share some memories. So I'm going to open it up for that afterwards. But first, um, we do have a few questions. So um, Jenny Awas. 
or you're unmuted. Thank you, Daisy. It's Robin. Are we speaking? Sorry, Jenny's name. Oh, okay. My wife. Sorry, <laughs> Jenny's name is on the screen. Um, I uh, left Egypt in, on the 18th of December, 1956. I was eight years old, and uh, I have been back three times. I wasn't on this trip uh, to commemorate the reopening of, of the Elia Hanabi Synagogue, but uh, I had been back two years previously in 2018 uh, when my daughter wanted me to show her Alexandra through my eyes uh, and it was again a very emotional trip and even though my parents uh, were married uh, at the Eliohan synagogue and my father was breaking me lad there we actually belonged to the synagogue in sporting which uh, was built I believe I beg your pardon? Which is an area. For yes, sporting, <laughs> yes, certainly, uh, which I believe was built by my great grandparents. Uh, they were part of the families who contributed to build it. And uh, this is one of the buildings that Alex has said, uh, has explained, was sold off. Uh, and I've tried to find it, uh, and I couldn't find it on each occasion that I went, but I have photographs of it. And on my last trip in 2018, there was a fabulous exhibition uh, in the library, the new library of Alexandria, where a photographer had uh, displayed many, many beautiful photographs of life as it was pre-1956, in which uh, we took photographs, uh, Louise, my daughter Louise and I, uh, of these buildings. Um, Basically, I wanted to ask you, uh, I know that all these records now aren't there. In 1993, when I went with my wife, uh, Jenny, we actually saw these records and I was able to uh, get all the uh, cemetery numbers, uh, uh, plots, etc., where our relatives are, and I managed to locate everybody except my paternal grandfather. Uh, and um, I still would like to know the records there. So eventually, if ever any records are released, I would like to know who to contact to find these. He may have been buried in Cairo instead of Alexandria, I don't know, but my father was only two years old when he's, he lost his father. So there's nobody where there. The, the question ask. is, where would, who would we ask for the, for the records once they are? Well, one would, ha one would have to look up the name uh, and approximate date of, uh, you know, the, the deceased date and uh, take it from there. Alec? Well, uh, in Alexandria, one of the registers actually chronologically by date of death lists all the plots, you know, which kism, what we used to call, which area, which row in the cemetery and in which cemetery, because there are three cemeteries, that person is buried. Um, there have been a couple of attempts since to actually plot the cemeteries, in other words, uh, sort of do a map with the names of the tombs. Uh, this is something we hope to resurrect, perhaps. But at the moment, uh, we're waiting for those registers. I have not got a good answer for all. Thank you, you Alec. Um, I'm just going to see um, if I can just go through the uh, things. If you have a question, just raise your hand. Simone. Yeah, I don't have a question, but I wanted to actually say uh, that I'm so much agree with Ifedida because uh, I think that really when I left also in 56, it, it must have been closure for me because to some extent, I remember a lot of things, but there are a lot of things that also probably choose not to remember because it was actually very sad the way we left. I actually went back quite a few years later with my daughter, who was then maybe about 19. And obviously we had to go via Cairo. We flew to Cairo and we were supposed to stay there a few days. And then we had a ticket to go to Alexandria. I didn't know Cairo very well, but I was so disappointed with the way 
Cairo even looked, I imagined Alexandria was going to disappoint me so much that I actually didn't go back. I left my, I, I, I said to myself, I am not going to go back. This isn't the way I remember it. And therefore, I never did go back, although I was just so close. But I didn't want to, because I do agree with Yves Fedida. Thank you. What did Yves Fedida say? Yves Fedida said it was closure. It was closure. Yeah. It, it, it is closure. Uh, obviously, there are a lot of very good things that we are now remembering almost later because things are better for us now. And our time in Alexandra was a very happy time, but it was, uh, it's, not, it's not now, uh, obviously, as we remember it. And it could be quite sad to go back because it, it's nothing like what we lived. Your sister went back, went to Thank you, Simone. Uh, Sami Ibrahim, uh, you've got a question. Uh, go ahead, you should be unmuted. Yes, uh, good evening everybody. Um, uh, my question to Alec. Um, uh, Alec uh, um, is, uh, uh, had a, a, very, um, a very serious statement now that, uh, I don't know if it was Alec or, uh, no, I think it was Eva, uh, saying that um, uh, uh, all the effort that had been done in Egypt recently was concerning buildings. Uh, wh what about the cemeteries? Where are we from the cemeteries? Um, um, I, I took over this issue of uh, the cemeteries in, in Cairo since four years. I'm, I'm, I'm fighting for this and uh, uh, without any support from anybody uh, just to, um, 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 uh, to preserve the memory of our ancestors. Uh, this, I don't think that the government um, uh, uh, will treat it, uh, as you say, uh, synagogue, they're treating it as a place uh, for tourism. No, cemetery, this is remain uh, this is you're talking about cemeteries dated 1200 years old and uh, we remain a jewish cemetery and one of the the, the oldest uh, jewish cemetery in the world and i don't see anybody um, um, putting um, 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 his hand in, a po in his pocket to get out uh, one euro for contribution for this um, and uh, when uh, uh, the group um, uh, 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 when, when they went to celebration in, uh, in Alexandria and they came to Cairo and then assisted to, um, uh, to uh, collect a donation of $20, $100 per person uh, just to contribute it to the cemetery, nobody was happy about it. Um, uh, for my knowledge, uh, uh, always uh, the big projects that have been done in, 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 uh, in Jewish uh, uh, um, uh, uh, community was always based on uh, raising funds. Where are we from there? So, okay. would um, one of you like to respond, um, maybe talk a little bit about more about the cemeteries. Could you tell us what the state of the cemeteries are in? You said that they were cleaned up before and, and all three of you wow. visited. What, what state are the cemeteries in at the moment? I think you've got to distinguish between the Alexandria cemeteries, there are three, and the Basatin cemetery in Cairo. The Alexandria cemeteries were not very well maintained by the community, but they are, what I would say, relatively intact. And we did this cleaning up work before we, you know, for this uh, visit in February. The Cairo cemetery is different because in, I think, the mid-60s or the mid-70s, a new street was opened in the center of Cairo and lots of shops and restaurants opened up. And they actually went to the Christian and Jewish cemetery in Cairo to lift the nameplates on the tombs. So one of the problems, the, the tombs are not what you call, strictly speaking, desecrated, but they are now anonymous. So we don't know who is buried where in Cairo. Now, what Sami did not say, Sami is part of a group in Cairo called the Drop of Milk, which was an old uh, Jewish charity, which uh, they changed the statute, which was basically originally for uh, impoverished children, orphans, etc. And they have re, re sort of resurrected that charity 
and ch change the Articles of Association, the statutes, to actually also include preservation of the uh, Jewish heritage, religious heritage. And they have done a really excellent work of cleaning up the cemetery in Cairo, etc., but and protecting it because it was the walls surrounding it had collapsed. And at one point, if you wanted drugs, if you wanted a Kalashnikov, if you wanted anything like that, you would go to the Basatin Cemetery and you'd find somebody who would sell you what you wanted. So they have at least now completed the wall, and but they've raised the funds themselves. There have been some funds from America. Sami, perhaps you'd like to add to this. Um, Sami Ibrahim. Yeah. yeah. It should be, if you're me. Yes. Yes, yes, I'm here. Um, uh, the, um, uh, the, the, the big challenge we're facing now uh, in Basatin that, um, uh, as you all know, that uh, we, uh, there was uh, the, the, the ring road who passed by uh, Basatin um, in, um, 25 years ago. Uh, now uh, the government is trying to um, uh, uh, enlarge this, uh, uh, this uh, ring road. And um, since uh, we start to raise some um, uh, fund from, uh, um, um, and we'd like really to uh, also to, uh, to highlight uh, that uh, the, um, the congregation of um, uh, Brooklyn um, uh, did a lot of contribution. And, um, uh, and uh, thanks to uh, Clement Sofer and uh, Joseph Dweck, uh, they raised is um, equivalent uh, of uh, 20 uh, 30,000 US dollar and uh, now we have uh, unfortunately because of uh, corona issue we have uh, a regular uh, orthodox rabbi is coming uh, to supervise the cleaning of uh, uh, basatin so now what we have with the government now that uh, um, they ask us um, um, to, uh, to to take another uh, extra um, uh, 15 meters from both sides of the bridge uh, with a length of 125 uh, meters uh, to enlarge the, uh, the, the ring road. Uh, of course, we told them uh, we don't have any uh, rabbinical uh, existing or any uh, experience to say if this is, can be done or not. We, you have to take uh, uh, this um, um, uh, action uh, in coordination with rabbinical um, authority. And uh, this is how uh, now we are, uh, we are putting them in contact with the um, uh, Avra Kadesh, uh, this is the association who been in charge um, 30 years ago about uh, the, 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 the cemetery. And um, unfortunately, because of Corona, they cannot come, but they are on, um, and we, we put them on contact. So at least this showed that uh, the Egyptian government is keen and, um, um, and, don't, and don't want to, to, to create trouble. Um, 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 to be frank about it, uh, 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 President Sisi is trying his best to do things, but in the same time, uh, we're talking about accumulation of uh, uh, anti-Semitic um, uh, um, uh, action that have been taken um, for more than, um, uh, I would say, uh, more than eight years. So um, you cannot change the mentality in uh, in uh, in, uh, in uh, over one night. It has to have to to take time. So. Um, um, uh, the satin, it's true, you don't have marble, but um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm doing my best personally, since I'm the one responsible for this uh, cemetery. We're trying to uh, restore as much as possible, at least for the one who died 20, from, from 20 years ago now. And the plus we have this um, uh, list that have been done by Aaron Kivat, um, a lawyer in, um, in the States. And uh, we had, he identify, uh, um, during the time of uh, Carmen Weinstein, the, the previous uh, head of the Jewish community, uh, 2,000 graves. So we do, we, we, we do have more than 2,000 graves identified in Basatin. But again, regardless, I, I saw in, in Marrakesh, I saw in, um, in, um, in Casablanca, a lot of cemetery where um, um, in, uh, in two, two centuries ago, Jews didn't, didn't, didn't write names. On it so you have a lot of anonymous this is not an excuse for abandoning this um, old cemetery we, we we have to stick together um, i know archive is very important but uh, um, uh, archive will come sooner or later i'm sure about it it will come uh, they, they they cannot they cannot stop it uh, the maximum they were going to filter filterize it they, they, they want to to see what is what because 
nobody can say what, what is in this archives. So the fear about, um, about uh, uh, using it in claims, uh, this is justified because always we have a neighbor that always uh, they are raising from time to time that we, we need to uh, collect this amount uh, about the Jews' property. So this is always at its end, it's a, it's a political issue. I'm just going to thank you very much, Sammy. I'm going to stop you there because we've got a few more questions on, on different subjects. Okay. But okay. thank you very much. Um, before I do go to those questions, I know a few of you want to connect with each other and you can't message each other in the chat. I can't change that setting now um, and I can't find a way to change that setting. So what I'm going to do is hang on at the end of the meeting and if you want to connect with each other, if you message me, I can put you in touch with each other. Um, I can't think of another way to do that at the moment, but I will hang on for as long as you want me to putting you all in touch with each other um, at the end of this, if you just hang on for that. Um, there is a question, if the future of the community is tourism, are there any provisions uh, to, to train tour guides so that they have um, accurate information about the Jews in Egypt? Um, I'll go to Alec for this and then if uh, Ellie or Josiane, if you've got any ideas or input, just let me know. When we were in Alexandria, we, there was one guide, an Egyptian woman, Zahra, who actually specializes in the Jewish history of Alexandria, knows a lot. She also actually did an amazing amount of work before we arrived by trying to locate the tombs in the cemeteries for the people who had said they were coming and they wanted to find the tomb of their grandparents or their parents or whatever. So there is at least one in Alexandria. I think there are, you know, certainly in Cairo through the Goutte de Lay, they do have a few guides, but at the moment I think uh, there is no concerted action, although it would obviously have to be done if uh, tourism or Jewish tourism does take off, you know, once the whole virus thing blows over. Thank you. Um, Bea, you had a question. Yeah, I have a question for you. I, I think what comes across very strongly is how important the tangibility of memory is, how important the building was and the, you know, the, the signs, the little signs in the synagogue. And I just wonder whether, is there any effort to create any other memorials so I'm thinking of, you know, Stolpersteiner in Germany or other places of memory. Is there any chance that other spaces of memory could be created in Alexandra and Cairo? Oh, sorry. Um, sorry, Alec, could you just start from the beginning again? No, at this point in time, I'm not aware of any other initiative beyond the synagogue and the cemeteries and what we're trying to do to you know get copies of the registers thank you right um if you would like to be unmuted if you are on the trip and you want to sorry one minute i see zahra is chatting uh zahra would you like to say something about your zahra awad the work you are doing in the cemeteries uh yep she should if you unmute yourself there you go Hello everyone, uh, I'm Zahra, I really miss you all and I'm enjoying uh, joining you here, enjoying, I'm so emotional because I'm here with you again. Um, I'm Zahra, <laughs> maybe some of you already have met me during the trip and as I told you, I'm still working right now. I identified some of the graves and I'm still working right now, uh, right now working in identifying the rest of the grave and trying to make a map. But I have a comment concerning the registration. Uh, it's easy to find a way. It's just to send an official email to the government, tell that this will help the routes tour, that we have routes in Egypt and we are so interested to come back and we'd like to see our uh, cemetery, our uh, houses. And I think it will help to get a copy of uh, uh, of uh, a, a copy of all the registry because for example I have uh, I had many tourists since 2000 and they came here and we already have seen the registry with Mrs. Matatia and it was easy to find where is the grave is where is the house used to be where is 
all the information concerning everyone and it was easy to recognize. So we can make the same right now, ask the government to give a copy to help the tourism. If they will say it will help the tourism, I think they will must get even additional copy or software to a publication at the, uh, at the synagogue. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you very much. I have <laughs> really enjoyed being here. Really interesting. Thank you. Right. So uh, if you would like to uh, unmute yourselves, uh, please feel free to do so. If you'd like to say hello to each other, um, you can now unmute yourselves. And uh, yeah, <laughs> if anyone would like to, to, to say something about the trip that they were on, anything like that, please just let me know. I'm going to look for hands up. I'm looking for physical hands up. Uh, can, can, Eve, yes. Can I just say um, how fortunate we were to have Zahra around uh, both before, during and after the trip. Um, and she's, she has done a, a tremendous uh, amount of work. Her grandmother was Jewish and that's probably what motivates her. I know she is uh, very sensitive to that, uh, to that point and I think we are all indebted to her. Um, I just want to answer her about the fact that the government would answer us if we say that this is for tourism. We are not, we are talking about one register uh, in uh, Alexandra which contains the names and location of the tombs. But in fact, there are over 60,000 pages. There are over, I don't know, a hundred registers and we're not just interested in finding the tombs of our parents. Many of us know where they are located, and we know that Zara will certainly find them when we can't, we can't, where we don't know where they are located. What we are really interested in is our history, our story, the story of our parents, of our grandparents, of our great grandparents. The registers in Alexandria go back to 1830, <coughs> and it is a scandal that we who are part of these registers should not have access to them. We're not just talking about cemeteries, we're talking about births, weddings, uh, engagements, bar mitzvahs, uh, even uh, uh, giving money for, for brides who ca he came from poor family. Oh. This is the whole history of this community. And I think it's, it's, a, it's understandable that people uh, outside of Egypt who were kicked out of Egypt so indignantly would be reticent to send any money to Egypt unless there was some kind of reconciliation mode, which is a copy of these registers to be deposited abroad. And I really insist that this is something we should all be fighting for because it is not right. This is not right. We were kicked out. We were dispossessed of material things. We should not be dispossessed of our identity and we should not be dispossessed of our history. Okay. Yes, uh, Simone. <laughs> oh, there's lots of- Yeah, I, I just want to agree with everything that Yves Fedida said. You're my greatest <laughs> fan, Simone. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Philip is Maloon. Sorry, I hope I've said that right. <laughs> What was it you were particularly agreeing with just now? Yeah. Yes, hello. Hello, everybody. Hello, Very happy to, to be here with you, and I'd like to greet uh, all the organizers uh, for this uh, event and very interesting um, discussions. And hello to, a uh, special hello to, to Zara. <laughs> <laughs> hello. Thank you. Uh, would anyone else like to say anything? Uh, yes. Um, Josette. Yes. You have to uh, just unmute yourself as well. There you go. Is that all right? Can yes, you... now we can hear you. I'm not part of your group. I live in Rome and I've been here since uh, 1955 because I left Egypt to study music in Rome but my parents left in 56 when they were kicked out my stepfather was English but my grandparents were the Negrin I don't know if any of you have heard of the Negrin family there were 12 
children of my grandparents. And now they're all over the world. Nobody is left in Egypt. A lot of them are in Australia, some in France, some in England. And uh, I'm in Italy because my father was Italian. In the synagogue, which is magnificent now, all of my uncles and my grandparents and great grandparents got married there. We have no documents at all about what happened to all of them. But um, I just want to say a lot of you are sad because life is not the same any longer there. I've been back a couple of times and I will say this for the Egyptians. I think they're lovely, they're warm hearted, they cook magnificently and uh, when you go back to Alexandria and you go along the Corniche and uh, you smell the Mediterranean smell, I have never ever had the same beautiful perfume coming out of the sea as the one in uh, Stanley Bay and Sidi Beach, all those beautiful beaches that there are and they are still there. And I wish some of you would think about all those lovely uh, memories that we have of the seaside and Benjamin. I went to the Lycée Francais, which was just opposite Saint Marc. And uh, I have lovely memories, but life goes on and you have a new life. And uh, it was great to hear all of your very moving stories. And I'm very, very happy to have been amongst you. A cousin of mine, Lina Sassoon, I don't know if she's here somewhere. She lives in London and she is the one who told me about this getting together on Zoom, which is a magnificent invention for all of us. I don't know how we would have survived the pandemic without it. So thank you all. And I recognize a lot of uh, family names because many of my classmates were either Nakamuli or uh, Ar my English teacher was Arwas. I don't know if it was your mother, maybe. Thank and you. Yeah. Thank you, Josette. That was lovely. Um, Zara, you wanted to add something? Yeah, I'd like to add, first of all, just to the first step, to get our heritage back. And as Mr. <laughs> Fidida said, I'm very proud because my grand family, they are Jews. So it's part of my culture and part of my religion and part of my, my life. First thing we have to do that's just to convince and tell the world that we have Egyptian Jew, not just Muslim and Christian. So if everyone in Egypt started to know that they have the right to get their certificate back, they get their everything back, this is the only way. And I think this is the first step by the integration of the synagogue. The second step, we already had some movie about the Jews of Egypt. The third step that they have to have be always in connection with the government that we are Egyptian because no one can deny that the, Egyptian, the Jew are Egyptian. The Egyptian Jew, they are part of the community here and nothing can change that. And as a Muslim have the birth certificate and the Christian have a birth certificate, the Jews of Egypt must have a birth certificate and the comments as well. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Would anyone else like to add something just before we end up? Uh, Eve, Sharma, I'm going to come back to you just to see if there's anyone else who hasn't spoken. Um, Janine. I'm unmuting myself. Yes, thank you. <laughs> yes, I would like to uh, say that I unfortunately didn't come to Egypt with you this time. But I went before, we took our two sons there, and of course we visited the school, the Lycée Francais, and the, the synagogue, British boys, school. British boys School for my husband. And I, um, and we, when we visited the synagogue, there were about five Jews there, one of them being this uh, Matatia, and this lady, and then there was also the, the man you talked about. Anyway, they were very old already. It was years ago and someone asked me if i wanted to unscrew the plate with my father's name 
so I could take it. And I said, no way, this has to stay there. Now I am so glad I left it there. And I want to thank Philippe Ismaloum for sending a picture to my brother, René Cori. So René sent it to me and I was very moved. It's nice and shiny. <laughs> So anyway, um, I wanted to, to, and everyone was very nice. When we arrived there, we said we're born in Egypt. They say, Ahlan was Ahlan, welcome home. So, you know, it was, a, it was a nice feeling. And like many of you said, it was probably a closure. So there you go. And thank you, Alec, and the other, uh, Eli and Roger and everyone for your hard work. I guess there is no a way to get the Sefers back. Is there? Are there, are there plans to, are, is the plan to leave the Sefer there, Alec? No, take I them out. Take them out, take, recuperate them. Probably not. I know you've tried. I know Nebi Daniel has tried, so that's okay. We'll hear later about it. Thank you. Thank, Thank you all very much, very much for this fantastic uh, meeting. Can I add one little thing? Yes. My name is Joseph and as part of my work record, I had to travel to Egypt at least 30 or 40 times between 1980 and 1990. I always found the people there most hospitable, most uh, accommodating and very nice really and I remember one day I was on the tramway between Shadby and uh, wherever, wherever. <laughs> and as we used to do I, I had rolled the ticket and stuck it in my wedding ring and the conductor when he came to check the tickets I gave it to him and said ah Entamenen where are you from I said I'm originally from uh, Cairo from Alexandra he said, Ahlan wa sahlan, enta andak. Welcome, true? you are home. It was a nice place. And, and uh, yeah, as I say, you. I have very, very, very fond memories of Alexandria. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Alec, would you like to just add something quickly about the Torah scrolls of Sefer, the Sefrim? Are, they, are there plans to keep them there? or? Well, the problem is you have in Egypt the antiquities law. You cannot take out anything which is older than a hundred years. Where even if it's got nothing to do with Egypt, if you've got an impressionist painting which is older than a hundred years, nothing to do with Egypt, a Renoir, you can't take it out. Also now these Sefer Torah, I think Roger, Roger, do you want to say something about the Sepharim? I think they're under the property of the Ministry of Antiquities. What is the situation? Roger or Yves? Uh, Roger, you should be... No, um, unmute yourself. Un unmute yourself. No, 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 sure. no he's okay. Yeah, okay. Is. All the Sifre Torah, because they are antiquities, or the great majorities are antiquities, are under the Ministry of Antiquities. They are listed as uh, being protected by the Ministry of Antiquity and they cannot be used for anything other than a religious function within the synagogues in Egypt. And there is no way that they can be exported. We have asked, we have uh, said that maybe they can be lent to uh, communities from Egypt abroad and the answer has always been no. Uh, we have done a survey of all the Sifre Torah in Cairo and we have an exact understanding of how uh, kosher or not kosher they are because a lot of them have been spoiled and from a religious point of view cannot be used uh, for any religious service. However, there are some that are still intact, some of which in Alexandria were uh, we use during this celebration, but as far as the government is concerned, this is an Egyptian antiquity that has to remain in Egypt. Uh, some people Thank would you. 
that those seferim have been donated by families and individuals, and as such, they are their own property. And there has been cases, and one in particular, where about seven, seven seferims were taken out. There is a Lord Siegel uh, from England who went to Egypt just as there was the peace treaty with Israel, and he went to see Sadat, and Lord Siegel was married to someone from Egypt who had donated, their family had donated this Sefretora, uh, and they were taken out, and I believe they are now in uh, the museum in Camden in, in, in London. But that's the only case where a specific approval was given by the president for taking some Sefretora out. But our attempts have uh, uh, proved futile. Thank you. Um, Can I just add something there? Um, just very quickly, yeah, yeah, we've got a few people left and then I'm going to wrap up. So, well, Eve, yeah. Eve would like to say something. Yeah. yeah uh, on, the, on the question of Sefer Torah, as Roger said, we went to Cairo and with the help of uh, Sami Ibrahim, uh, we were able to, and, and uh, of a, of a sofer, uh, uh, a sofer, uh, fully qualified the rabbinical sofer, we were able to analyze each and every single Sefer Torah that was actually presented to us. Um, a scribe, uh, just for people who... Uh, yeah, a scribe. Um, obviously, the Egyptian law, the hundred year law can apply. Then you can, you, you can then ask your question, when does it apply from? Does it apply from the time that we were obliged to leave Egypt? Does it apply from today? Does it apply from the time that we raised the problem with the Egyptian government? That's al already the question of which is the hundred year mark. But even so, within the number of Sifre Torah that we were able to analyze, there were a great number that could be used, repaired, and uh, sent abroad to be either lent or gifted to communities elsewhere and maybe a, um, be used to raise money for the cemeteries. Because these are in good condition, they are less than 100 years old even today, and they, they, are, um, they belong to families that have no heirs. So there is a, there is the, the, the question is not a question of whether it's, it is feasible, because legally it is feasible. The question is one whether there is a will to do it on the Egyptian uh, government part. And as I said earlier, they will do everything for whatever stays in Egypt, for whatever remains in Egypt, but they will do sweet nothing for anything that has to go out or that will benefit Egyptian Jews outside or Jews outside in general. Thank you. Um, Eve Sharma, you wanted to say something? All I was going, all I was going to say is uh, to Eve, Jose, Alec. Uh, now I guess we're getting very near running out of time. Now in ten years' time, we'll all be, uh, you know, in our seventies, late seventies, early eighties. Thereafter, the interest will diminish. So we now have one last uh, period of five or ten years for the ones that still remember Egypt. I left in '56, as as you all, as most of you, and uh, I returned after 63 years for the first time. So, can we make one last uh, unified stance from whatever means we have uh, at our disposal to try again? I can think more of us get involved? I think that's it? there's a lot of nodding happening. So, I'm assuming that's a. Uh, positive response. Um, I'm going to now um, hand over to Bea to say uh, just some closing remarks. Thank you all very much for coming. Um, and then I will hang on afterwards if you do want to connect with each other. Um, I'll be here and I'll try and facilitate that as best as I can. Bea? Thank you, Daisy. I just, just wanted to say really thank you to Alec, Eli and Josiane for coming onto the panel and for Daisy for chairing this beautifully. Um, and I think it really shows how important history is, how important this returning to a place you come from. And also I would say how important the testimonies are in the light of 
that the, the situation that there are no memorials, that it's difficult to go back. Um, and I think I would urge you, please, if you haven't been interviewed, please get in touch with us. Uh, you can email us at info at sofadivoices.org.uk and we can do, at the moment, Zoom interviews. So please do get in touch with us. Um, and hopefully, my dream would be that some of the interviews, let's say all our 17 Alexandrian interviews, would be available, even maybe in Arabic, uh, in Alexandria itself. So to me, that would be a wonderful uh, thing for the future. So thank you very much, and hopefully see you again soon.